If you're like me, you used the newest version of A Star is Born as an excuse to revisit the other ones, 1937, 1954, and 1976. What interests me about this franchise is that the skeleton of the plot is actually really flexible. Each movie-going generation molds it to reflect an evolving perspective on stardom. Even though major plot points stay the same, little things give us clues about our cultural and cinematic history. I couldn't really pass up the opportunity to talk about all of this in the year of a new star is born. So strap in, because in this video, I'll chart some of the things that differentiate and connect these films, and then I'll get into some history, some analysis, and hopefully this will contribute to your understanding of the new film. Let's get started. So the specifics of each film vary, but the storyline basically adheres to this plot. Esther Blodgett wants to break into show business. She meets Norman Maine, a very famous and successful entertainer, totally by chance. He's taken with her and helps her launch her career. Norman, meanwhile, suffers from alcoholism, which in turn is ruining his career. They get married, Esther's career takes off, she becomes Vicky Lester, and her fame eclipses his. She wins a major award, but Norman ruins the evening by interrupting her speech. He goes to rehab, but it doesn't take, and he gets into more trouble. He overhears Esther consider quitting her career to focus on him and his recovery. He can't stand this and commits suicide. Esther returns to the stage to honor her husband's memory and continue her career. 1937's A Star is Born stars Janet Gaynor and Frederick March. The first version of A Star is Born is probably the most underrated, likely because Janet's hold on modern pop culture is considerably lighter than Judy Garland or Barbra Streisand's. But it's sweet and raw, and most importantly, precise, avoiding the excesses of its later iterations. It's also a time capsule of a very specific era in Hollywood history. 1937 was an interesting time. The worst of the depression was over, war wasn't quite imminent, and the studios had a ton of power over their image and employees. Hollywood had room to be hopeful and self-reflective. In kind, A Star is Born both acknowledges Hollywood's veneer and endorses it. It's a send up, a propaganda piece, and a sincere tribute rolled into one. We meet Esther in North Dakota. She's antsy because she wants to go to LA to follow her dreams. She has an indestructible quality. She knows exactly what she wants, and you never have the sense that she won't get it. The North Dakota origin arc from nobody to movie goddess helps create a compelling narrative, but it's also really important because in 1937, you don't become a star without an origin story. So it would have seemed incomplete to leave one out. Here's how you become a star in 1937. Someone from the studio sees you. It could be literally anywhere, in the chorus or at a soda fountain. You do a screen test. If you have star quality, you're signed. You get a new name that sounds better than your real one. They change your appearance to make you prettier. And then they give you an origin story to make you interesting and brand you as a type. This really happened in Hollywood. And this is exactly what happens in the movie. Esther Blodgett becomes Vicki Lester. Jester Hester, Jester Lester, Vicki Lester. Oh, I like that. She gets a new story. No, I was born in Fillmore, North Dakota. Oh, no. Trey saw a light of day in a mountain cabin, a trapper's hut, high up in the Rockies. This wasn't an expose. As Janine Basinger wrote, quote, the star machine was never a secret. Hollywood wasn't concerned about the public discovering that their favorite darlings were manufactured, end quote. Instead, they took ownership of it, told the public all about it, and then glamorized it. The message was, this could be you. Sure, you're a normal girl from Montana, but so was Myrna Loy. This version frequently reminds us that the stars everyone knew and loved went through this exact process. Come on, now don't be foolish. They all had to go through this. Harlow, Lombard, Myrna Loy, and now Esther Blodgett. When Esther first arrives in Hollywood, she's immediately starstruck. It doesn't matter that Esther is Academy Award winner Janet Gaynor, because the audience connects immediately to her sense of awe. They love Shirley Temple too. They could become movie stars too. Also, three cheers for Janet Gaynor's impressions, like on point. Will you have some more, Dev? You do like our Dev, don't you? The studio system is doing here what it does best promoting an image. 
this part of A Star Is Born makes becoming a movie star look really cool and accessible. But the movie also makes becoming a star look really terrible. And nobody knew that dark side better than Judy Garland. The process of making 1954 A Star Is Born was kind of nightmarish, some of which I detail in another video, which I'll link to somewhere, and some of which you're better off just reading about it in Ron Haver's book about this film. But needless to say, literally nothing went smoothly. And despite this, the results are pretty great. Cukor and screenwriter Moss Hart made some key changes that transformed the 1930s melodrama. The most obvious is it's a musical now. From 1947 to 1951, the number of people going to movies twice a week went from 90 million to 54 million, thanks to TV. So movies had to be increasingly big and colorful to sell, and musicals did this really, really well, and since Judy Garland was looking for a comeback vehicle, seemed like the perfect fit. By 1954, Hollywood didn't care to talk about where stars came from because the star system was on its way out. So. Goodbye, North Dakota origin story. This Esther is originless and has a vague goal to become a successful singer. Oh, the record will become number one on the hit parade. We played on the jukeboxes all over the country. And I'll be made. <laughs> End of dream. Is there one thing wrong with that? I know. It won't happen. Hart smartly uses this as his means of creating the musical. Every song in A Star Is Born is diegetic, which means it's performed in front of a fictional audience that knows it's watching a performance. In other words, there's no Judy wistfully singing to herself out of a window. The context of each song charts her progress from anonymous chorus girl to main attraction. Norman first meets Esther when he stumbles drunkenly on stage as he performs at a benefit concert. Having Norman witness Esther perform makes his immediate infatuation and subsequent career assistance a little easier to buy, as opposed to running into her when she's working at a party. This is one of the many genius moves Moss Hart contributed to this version. Another was how thoroughly he unpacks Esther and Norman, who here is played by James Mason. Norman is, on the whole, a much more sympathetic character in 1954. He's refined and intelligent and self-aware, the 1937 Maine was a charmer, but coarse and not very self-reflective. The most obvious barometer of Norman's growth is the Oscar debacle. March is angry, boorish, and aggressive. Gentlemen of the Academy and fellow suckers, I got one of those ones for a best performance. They don't mean a thing. Mason gives a desperate plea. Well, I need a job now. Now that's it, that's, that's, that's the speech, that's it. I need a job. His sincerity makes the speech more painful, Vicky's love for him more tragic, and therefore the climax more effective. Judy's Esther is more vulnerable and uncertain of her talent than Janet's. Even though she lives for singing, really, she's just happy to be here. You don't know how many years it's taken me to get this far. I'm doing fine, Mr. Maine, just great. Their comparative vulnerability is most pronounced in how they deal with Norman's alcoholism. Take the scene where Esther explains her marital troubles to her producer. In 1937, it's pretty short and reserved. Tonally, it fits the movie. It's sad, but it doesn't really overwhelm her. In 1954, this monologue completely unravels into a heartbreaking confession. Because he tries, he does try. But I hate him for failing. I hate me too. I hate me because I failed too. This stands out for a lot of reasons. One, again, a great choice by Moss Hart to unpack Esther's feelings and raise the stakes for Norman's downfall. Two, Judy acts the hell out of this scene. Cukor acknowledged that he pushed her to draw from personal experience here because, in a lot of ways, Judy was Norman Maine. She struggled with substance abuse, didn't always have an easy time finding a job, spent some time in rehab, and ultimately, albeit accidentally, ended up killing herself. Three, it tonally subverts its genre. Jane Foyer points out that A Star is Born critiques the dominant syntax of movie musicals from the 1950s. 
Singing in the Rain, An American in Paris, Guys and Dolls, The King and I, etc. They all have a lot of depth, but they aren't somber experiences. This scene and those that follow evoke a kind of post-war psychological intensity that's more similar to dramas like On the Waterfront or East of Eden. It's an arresting reminder that while A Star is Born does have its glittery moments, it is a tragedy, and that's subversive in its own way. In her first public appearance after her husband's death, she introduces herself as not Vicki Lester, but as Mrs. Norman Maine. This is supposed to be a sweet moment where she acknowledges how much he meant to her and how much he's still part of her life. And it is that. It is also very much how someone would express that feeling in 1954, something the next Esther would push back against. Once again, production on A Star is Born was a nightmare. Director Frank Pearson wrote a whole op-ed about it, which was awkward. The film was poorly reviewed, but did very well financially. The studio mandated that it be a musical, which Barbara didn't like at first, but hey, good for her because she ended up being like the only person to ever win an Oscar off of this franchise. So far. Screenwriters Joan Didion and John Gregory Dunn, being the geniuses that they are, made a significant and brilliant change. Now Esther and Norman are rock stars. This is the best change for three reasons. One, it allowed them to keep the same format as the original. Movie musicals weren't as popular in 1976 as they were in the 50s. So a movie about a woman building her entire career on movie musicals would have seemed out of place. Barbara herself hadn't even been in a musical for six years. So you can keep the music and remain diegetic by becoming a rock star. This kind of tricks the audience into watching a musical because they feel like they're at a concert. Two, it felt more modern. The landscape of pop culture changed and so did its music. In 1954, many mainstream pop artists were also stars of movie musicals. Doris Day, Frank Sinatra, Eddie Fisher. The music could simultaneously reflect a theatrical sensibility and contemporaneous pop. And then rock happens. The Grammys begin in 1959, and pop music becomes exclusively musicians. The Eagles, Elton John, Joni Mitchell, there's Woodstock, Monterey Pop, etc., etc. Didion and Dunn smartly realized that this story necessitated new framing to feel relevant. Three, self-destructive entertainers looked different in 1976. A new type of celebrity bred its own legends of success and failure. Audiences didn't see John Barrymore as the poster child for self-destruction. They had Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin. John Norman has a very 70s breakdown, resulting in his potentially accidental death. Barbara's boyfriend wanted it that way. Shrug. But the most interesting thing is Esther's very 70s reaction. This Esther is living through the women's movement. Title IX, Roe v. Wade, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and the outlawing of marital rape all passed within five years of this film. The UN declared 1975 International Women's Year. As a woman of the 70s, Barbara's Esther reflects the freedom and confidence her peers would have had, or at least were fighting for. She's the most confident of the four. Nothing will stand in her way. And more than any other Esther, she has command of her art and its presentation. She also played with gender norms of the time. It was edgy to put makeup on John. Then five minutes later to wear a suit and order men around. Esther proposes to him and makes sure to say this at the ceremony for good measure. Now, anyway, obey is out, you know, at the dawn of the new century. In the end, she hyphenates her last name rather than taking his completely. Esther Hoffman Howard. A lot of this probably has to do with Barbara herself, who exerted a lot of creative control on the project, to the point that she brought in her own wardrobe and credits herself for it too. So if you haven't seen the new A Star is Born yet, here is your chance to turn back before spoilers. If you have seen it, or at least a trailer, you know the most recent iteration keeps the 1976 rock star slash Grammys element. It largely adheres to the major plot points of the other versions, except now it's 2018 and you can say fuck every two minutes and watch YouTube. Its most important adjustment is that Norman, now Jackson, played by Bradley Cooper, has an extensive backstory. 
I think this actually follows a path laid out since 1954. As I mentioned earlier, James Mason's Norman is a kinder, more sympathetic character. Chris Christofferson builds on this in 1976. He has a goal to own his own record company, he loves Esther, but he just can't deal with the industry. And as much as those versions give that character more depth, we don't know much about him at all. Like Esther, he was originless. But now, we're in the age of the anti-hero. There are plenty of examples of guys who do bad things who we just still like because we get them, and really underneath, they're good people. In this landscape, where you can unpack one character over the course of six seasons, context is key. And Jackson gets a lot of context. Now he has a family, and a ranch, and a history of mental illness. These things propel his downfall more than his career or male fragility. And thank God they updated Jackson's ego. The previous Normans can't handle losing their identity when they're called Mr. Lester. Uh, sure, sign right there, Mr. Lester. Which would not work in 2018. Again, we can use the award show as a barometer of his growth. His Grammy scene is not a struggle with his position of power. It indicates a real, honest struggle with substances. All of this makes Jackson the most fleshed out character of the four and gives him a lot more screen time to the point that the movie is kind of more about him than it is about her. The Esther character here is named Allie because no one is named Esther anymore. And because we love Origins again, Allie has roots like in the 1937 version. They go to great lengths to give her a home life, but also no last name, so I guess no hyphenated option for the end. They also modernize her by making her a pop artist in the conventional sense, with dancers, costumes, and songs about ass. Although Allie is an echo of Barbara's version, she doesn't have the same agency as Barbara. Instead, her characterization harkens back to 37 and 54. We're right back to that star-making system. Think of her dyeing her hair, accepting the dancers, and worrying about her appearance as the 2018 version of sitting in that studio makeup chair. It's just a different way of willingly molding yourself into what someone thinks of as a star. Again, the concerns are the same. No, the nose is still the problem. But they take different shape to speak to contemporary audiences. Sam Elliott's character in the 2018 version says that music is how different people see and interpret the same 12 octaves. That's really what these films are, and that's why they're continually compelling. To truly compare each of these films down to the minutia would be a lot. There's millions of things that I've left out that I could still write a thesis about. Each production had insane behind the scenes stories. I don't know, do you want a video about that? What do you think of the new one? I have a lot of thoughts. Let me know in the comments, and obviously check out my channel if you like stuff like this. Thank you for watching!